So let's start our journey into the core rules of Warhammer 40k 10th edition with a look at the game's turn structure, what your leaders and commanders can do for you in the command phase, and the perils of Battleshock. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're continuing in our series of how to play Warhammer 40k 10th edition, and this time it's time to hit the core rules, taking a blow by blow journey through the turn sequence of Warhammer. In the last video we talked about the things that you need to get together to start playing Warhammer 40k, and in this one I thought we'd start going through the turn bit by bit, and start with the core mechanics of the game before we get into more in-depth things. In reality, when you set up for a game, you'll need to actually go through the mission rules, which will vary a bit depending on what game mode that you're playing, whether you're playing a combat patrol mission, or a crusade game, or out of the mission deck. The game that you're playing will tell you how many points that you're playing, how you set up your army, and what sort of objectives you're going for. Say for example, in the mission deck cards, you might draw a deployment card, which determines how yours and your opponent's armies can set up. We'll delve into the mission types later, and start with the things that are generalised to each game of 40k. Regardless of which game that you're playing though, typically you'll wind up with something like this when you start in the game. Yours and your opponent's armies will be set up via a deployment map, say for example the one on the top left there, which shows you where you can start on the board, and then you should have your two armies on the tabletop, in and around some terrain, separated by a small gap, and no doubt raring to get stuck into each other, laying each other low by powerful weaponry, brutal melee violence, or sneaky tricks. From there, games of Warhammer 40k are played in turns and battle rounds, often five battle rounds being the norm for more standard games of Warhammer. During each battle round, each player will take one turn, and that player will move through these phases that you can see on the right here. Basically, they get to activate all their units to start with, commanding them, moving them, shooting them, and charging them into combat. Then that's their turn over. Their opponent takes their turn, and they move through the same steps, and together those two turns will have made one battle round. You can think about it as battle rounds are one game turn, and the actual things that they call turns are player turns. In general, 40k is a bit I go, you go. Most of your choices will be made during your own turn, and then in your opponent's turn, it'll just be rolling reactive saves, or maybe occasionally getting to fight with units that are still engaged in combat, but the bulk of the work is done by the active player. 10th edition does seem to be trying to shake this up just a little bit. A lot of datasheets and stratagems have abilities to trigger at some point during your opponent's turn, so you might have a few sneaky tricks to put a spanner in the works at some time or another. Just for the broad strokes of the turn, the command phase is when you'll usually trigger command abilities for your generals, say selecting buffs or using stratagems that might affect your unit for the entire turn. You also resolve battle shock in the command phase, that's basically 40k's leadership step. Then you go into the movement phase, moving your models around the board, and then at the end of this, this is when reinforcements come in. Then you get to light up your guns and roll your dice to see how well your shooting attacks do at the enemy firing your ranged weapons and trying to remove your opponent's models from the table. Then if any of your units want to try and charge the enemy units and get into combat, then this happens in the charge phase. It's basically a bonus movement phase, but solely for models that are trying to engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then after that you get to the fight phase. Typically charging units tend to fight first, though anything that's engaged in combat will get to attack. Both the active player and the non-active player get to fight with any models in combat here. Basically both you and your opponent will get to go through this entire sequence five times, hopefully laying the enemy army low along the way. In this video, seeing as it's the start of the turn, I thought we'd start with the command phase. This kind of feels like 40k's consolidated admin phase, and you run through this short sequence before going on to moving things. The main steps are that first up both players gain one command point, then you move on to the bulk of the phase where you resolve any command abilities, say character commands or stratagems or army-wide special rules. Then you go on to the leadership check, and you basically are resolving battle shock on your units, whether or not they're going to take that this turn, depending on their bravery. And then in 40k, there's often a few things that happen at the end of the command phase, scoring objectives perhaps one of the most important things. First up, the first thing that happens in the command phase is that both players gain a command point. Command points are basically a fun resource that you have access to in Warhammer 40k, and you get to spend these on stratagems, powerful pop-up rules effects to represent your units using either clever tactics or particularly powerful bits of war gear that they might not necessarily use every turn. Usually at the start of the game, in 10th edition, both players won't start on any command points, so they'll only have their first one at the start of the first battle round, and then as you'll be gaining one in both players' command phases, you'll wind up with 10 of them to spend over the course of the game just naturally. It's pretty helpful to have a bit of a counter set aside to check how many command points you have, either just use a standard dice, or some people like to use big ones with more sides, just something that you can tell how many CP you're on, and then when you spend stratagems you can reduce it by the appropriate amount that you've spent. 
Strategy gyms are perhaps a bit of a weird place to start 40k rules really. In general there tend to be additional extras that make your units better in certain phases of the game, and we'll talk about them in a bit more detail when we go over the core stratagems later. The general idea though is that you get access to 6 of them in the detachment that you're playing, plus 11 universal ones that everyone can use, these are listed in the core rules, plus maybe some extra ones depending on the mission that you're playing, either things that are narratively appropriate or help out with objectives and things. Here's one example of a stratagem on the right hand side, this one's the protocol of the hungry void. This one basically makes a necron unit just a little bit more dangerous in combat for a phase, increases their strength stats and improves their AP by 1 if there's a character in the unit. Again maybe not worth getting too hung up with before you've gone through the basic phases of Warhammer 40k, but in 10th edition as with 9th there's a couple of basic rules that apply to stratagems. Unless there's a specific exception, you can't use the same stratagem twice in one phase of the game, so say for example you couldn't use this one to influence two different Necron units in the same fight phase, and also quite a lot of units and datasheets have abilities to generate you command points, say certain leaders that generate you a command point each battle round. No matter how many abilities like this you have, you can never use them to generate more than one command point per battle round, in addition to the ones that you get in each player's command phase, usually means that even if you've got very powerful rules like that, you'd usually only be generating up to around about 15 command points, even if you've got some snazzy leaders that do that easily. Then though, command point generation aside, you actually get into the meat of the command phase. This is the bit that most people would consider the core command phase, the section of the rules set aside to your leaders doing their leading. Often these will be rules that improve your own units, so say a leader telling a squad to do a certain thing and it makes them either stronger or tougher, or maybe declaring things like army-wide special rules that affect your entire army in the game. Generally speaking, your command phase things will happen after you generate a command point, but before the battle shock step, and some datasheet specific abilities might specify things like the start of your command phase, or the end of your command phase, I guess end of command phase would generally be after battle shock, so that would be an exception. The actual rules that you'd need to use here would vary army on army. The most common things would be things like unit abilities, say like certain key characters picking the aura buff that they get each turn, certain army wide special rules that might change turn on turn, these will be listed in the detachment rules and they might often be declared in the command phase, and then certain stratagems, particularly things that often last for an entire turn, they might often be declared in the command phase as well. Unless things specify any differently, you can use any of these in an order of your choosing, most of the time it won't be too important, but for a few things sequencing might help, say for example if you used an ability to regenerate some models in a squad, and then that put you in range of another command phase ability. To run through a few examples of command phase things, here we have the rules datasheet for Reboot A. Gilliman, he's got an ability that's circled on the right here called Author of the Codex, typically you'll find command phase things on the abilities column on the right of the sheet. His ability allows you to pick one of three powerful things to represent his leadership this turn, either helping out with objective control on leadership, allowing you some free stratagems, or allowing you to use the Oath of Moment ability an additional time. As it just says in the command phase, you can basically do it at any point in this step. Just seeing as it's come up, a fair few abilities in the command phase will often be Aura abilities. If Gilman chooses his Primark of the 13th Aura ability, then he gives a buff to units within 6 inches, and that helps out with their objective control and leadership. Aura abilities are measured from the outer point of the model's base, so Gilliman gets a great big bubble that goes 6 inches round him, and any space marine units that are partially in that bubble will get affected by it. In this setup here, it means that the Repulsor and the Heavy Intercessor squad, both of those will get affected by the leadership, even if they're only partly within the bubble, not every single model needs to be. But the gladiator tank on the bottom right that isn't within the 6 inch aura, so that won't get the boosted objective control or battle shock buffs. In 10th edition, characters always count as being in range of their own aura, so Gilliman will help himself out with any aura abilities he happens to have. These abilities are definitely a bit rarer in 10th edition than they were in 9th, but it can mean that certain armies want to castle up around their best leaders, put lots of units nearby to make good use of these powerful buffs. Another example of a command phase ability is the Space Marine rule Oath of Moment. This one is their whole army rule, and this one says that at the start of your command phase you need to select one unit from your opponent's army and make it very easy to kill. Every time any of your Space Marines target that unit, you get to both re-roll the hit roll and the wound roll. Again another very good example of a rule that triggers here. This one does specify at the start of the command phase though, so you'd be doing this at the same time as you generate your command point before you progress on to other things. 
Finally, here's an example of a stratagem that triggers in the command phase. This one's one for the great big stomping Imperial Knights. Basically, you get to pick an Imperial Knight that's taken some damage, and it gets a whole load of stat buffs for the turn, as it finds a bit of second wind and takes the fight to the enemy anew. This one lasts until the start of the next command phase, so it'll help out during your opponent's round as well. Then, after you've triggered all of your leadership abilities, the third step of the command phase goes on to resolving battle shock. This is basically the leadership mechanic of 10th edition Warhammer 40k, previously a knight that used to be at the end of the turn. This won't generally apply if you're going first in the game, but after that you might well be taking some casualties, and then each turn in this step you basically need to have a good look over your army, see if any of your units are below half strength, and if they are then they need to test battle shock, representing their morale wavering or them getting pinned down in firefights. You only take the test for your units during your command phase, you don't do so for your opponents, and basically it means that if your squad is below half strength, they'll continue to be testing battle shock on each of your turns. With regards to below half strength, they do clarify that. For squads with multiple models, it's as you'd expect. It does need to be below half strength, not exactly half strength. So say for example, if you had a unit of 10 intercessors at the start of the game, if they got depleted down to 5 models, they wouldn't need to test. But if you got depleted down to 4 models, then you would. Interestingly, in 10th edition, this also applies to single model units, which used to be fairly leadership immune. That one works on a per wound basis, so say if you had a tank with 13 wounds, if it got taken down to 6 wounds, then you'd start needing to test. If you've got a squad with an attached leader, a character that's joined the unit in the deployment phase, the leader does count to the starting strength of the squad, so say if you had 10 space marines plus an attached captain, then you would need to start testing Battleshock if you went down to 5 of them, as the leader means that the squad effectively had a starting size of 11. This is reassessed though if you ever actually lose the leader or the entirety of the squad. So say if that squad had all the space marines killed but just the captain remained, he wouldn't need to test battle shock unless he'd lost more than half health. Then once you've identified the units in your army that do need to test, the way that you do so is you roll two six-sided dice, aka 2d6, add the results together and you compare it to the unit's leadership characteristic. The leadership characteristic is generally listed as a number plus, say for example 6 plus or 7 plus. If you manage to roll above the number, then the test is passed, but if you roll lower than it, then your Battleshock test is failed. If your squad has multiple leadership values due to additional miniatures within the squad, or characters having joined it, then you use the highest leadership characteristic they have available. If you manage to roll high and pass the test, then all well and good, but if you roll low and fail it, then until the start of the next command phase, your unit is Battleshocked and takes some penalties. Here's the leadership characteristic on one example datasheet. Some Tyranid gene stealers here have a leadership of 7 plus. If they happen to have an attached leader in the unit that had a better leadership than this, say a leadership 6 plus, they would use that instead. It means that, say, if you had a unit of 10 gene stealers and they were depleted down to, say, 3 models left, in your command phase, you'd need to roll Battle Shock. If you rolled, say, a 2 for them and they failed, then they would need to take Battle Shock. Plenty of units have ways to alleviate or mitigate Battle Shock. The Tyranids get their Synapse rule, which allows them to test on 3d6 if they're near some big leader bugs, and that will make them a lot less likely to fail. If your unit does briefly succumb to the horrors of war though, then your unit is battle shocked and basically gets a trio of negative effects, and these apply to the start of your next command phase. These are the main downsides of being battle shocked, but you might get a few faction specific things that depend on the unit not being battle shocked. One example is the order system for the Astra Militarum. If they've got a unit that's basically broken to morale for a turn, then apparently they're not in the fit states to receive orders, so can't get those powerful boosts out of their commanders. If you're battle shocked, then these are the three penalties that you take basically for one battle round. First up, you count as objective control zero. The objective control stat being the one that allows you to actually hold points and score victory points in missions. That's a really big deal if your unit was on an objective and they fail leadership. It means you won't be scoring any victory points for that marker and that could directly contribute you to losing the game. The next one is a debuff that applies if you're locked in combat. If you happen to be in engagement range locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat with some enemy units, if you want to fall back out of that combat then you risk the chance of losing models. Basically each miniature in the unit that's falling back when they're battle shocked has to take a desperate escape test. Usually the miniature dies on the roll of a 1 or 2 on a d6 for each one of the miniatures. Often will mean that you're losing about a third of your squad and I'll cover that a bit more in the movement phase video. Finally and also pretty crucially you can't use any stratagems to affect the unit while they're battle shocked. A kind of cut off from command a bit I suppose. That again could be pretty vital. You wouldn't be able to use any big damage or defensive boosts or potentially other key things like firing overwatch or interrupting in the fight phase. 
The one exception to that is using the Insane Bravery core stratagem. That one's one command point and basically immediately cancels Battleshock, so your army does have a bit of defence against one bad roll if you're willing to spend the CP. That could be a bit of a drag on your command resources, but I feel like if your unit's just about to take an objective or you absolutely need them to use a key stratagem, this one could be worth it. The opponent can still affect the unit normally with any of their stratagems if they've got one that does something nasty to them. Overall, this trio of debuffs could be pretty painful, but in 10th edition 40k, unless you're actually falling back from an onrushing enemy, it doesn't actually cause you to directly lose models or for them to fight worse in any way. They still have their normal damage and defense, just no objective control, issues falling back, and can't use stratagems. Finally, that brings us to the end of the command phase, which isn't really listed in the core rules, but still some important things might well happen here. In particular, you might get certain mission objectives that are scored at the end of the command phase, say for example this take and hold one from the mission deck. This one gets you to score 5 victory points for each objective marker they control to a max of 15 victory points at the end of your command phase, and scoring victory points on objectives is generally how you win the games of 40k in the first place, so it's pretty crucial. Because this often happens in the command phase, and the command phase is before the movement phase, it means that you need to move on to objectives the previous turn, ideally with big hardy units that are going to be able to survive what the enemy has to throw at them, and then score you the points. It also means that Battleshock and the objective control thing can be a really big deal, as if your unit suddenly fails Battleshock and can't hold the objective, then all of a sudden they're not going to be able to score directly after. There may well be other units, faction special rules, or abilities that also trigger at the end of the command phase, so that would mean now after Battleshock. So broadly speaking, that's the Warhammer 40k command phase in a nutshell. Both players gain their command point, then you move on to your command abilities, usually done in the order of your choice, resolve Battleshock for the units in your army that are less than half strength, and then you might do a few things at the end of the command phase, particularly scoring certain objectives. After that, your command phase is done, you go on to the movement phase, and you begin to move your miniatures around the table, and take up some good positions to lay their firepower into the enemy, or claim those all-important objectives for the victory points. I'll aim to cover that in the next video. In any case, hope you've enjoyed a quick breakdown of the 40k command phase. If there's any other implications I've missed here, then please let me know. If there's any minor errors, I'll try and update the videos and pinned comments down below. I'll certainly be looking forward to continuing this series, going through the entirety of how to play 10th edition 40k. Feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, and if you've enjoyed these videos or found them useful, I would just like to mention that the channel does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.